Um, when you're going through the second part of um, the parable of the sower, and I will let you know ahead of time that um, so that there are no surprises. Today was supposed to be the, the closing part of the series. It was supposed to be only two part series. But as I revised it and massaged it, as I told you, the Lord puts yeast in the word, and if you touch it too much, it gets bigger. So it's a four part series now. So we'll be finishing this in July, just so that you know. So don't panic if we do not get to the soils it's themselves. We will spend some time um, learning about the insights. I think, like I told you, as a Bible worker, this parable became uh, one of the most practical ways to initiate and engage people with the Word of God. Number one, because they could see that the Bible can be interpreted by itself. It, it can be understood. And number two, because it speaks to our hearts. It speaks in a very real way to where we are spiritually. So having said that, um, let us have a word of prayer, and we can begin part two of our need for the seed of God. Lord, I want to thank you for the music. I want to thank you, Lord, that through the coins that sometimes we toss around, even in there we find uh, little messages of the gospel that we can trust God. Even with the pennies, you can do mighty things. Thank you, Father, for the song that reminds us that the centrality of your word is the message that God loves humans. God loves us. God loves me. And I pray that that can come across as well, Lord, as we explore your word. Teach us, Lord, from your word. We ask for the Holy Spirit to energize our minds. And, Father, for our hearts to be open and receptive. And grant me clarity of thought, Lord, that my expressions, though imperfect and frail, will not hinder the preaching of your word in its fullness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, Lord. Um, we're going to go to Luke chapter 8. We're going to review it again. I think familiarity with the passages will help us get, gain much, um, much insights. And I pray that the sermons will not be the all in all. Um, you probably have heard sermons on, in, in the past of, this, of the seed and I'm sure that if I ever go back to this uh, parable in the future, there will be new, fresh things that come out. So I invite you, if you would like to join me, uh, I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 8, the references in the screen, chapter uh, 8, verses 4 through 8, and then 11 through 15. I will be reading from the New King James, and I realize that there may be other translations. That is good. Uh, the more translations we can hear from or uh, uh, expose ourselves to, I think the better the, the breadth of the understanding can be. Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 8 reads as follows. And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and he was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rocks. And as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded up a crop a hundredfold. When Jesus had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 11 continues. Now the parable is this, says Jesus. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, who believe for a while, and in time of temptation fall away. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, Go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. 15. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with perseverance or patience. Last week we, we spoke um, quite extensively about the centrality of the seed, how Jesus is bringing it to the forefront. Yes, he's speaking of details of stones and birds and, and um, thorns and giving meaning to all those things. 
But all along this, the trajectory of this parable, there's one common denominator. And what's that common denominator throughout the whole parable? The seed, the word of God. Um, we spoke last Sabbath about um, some, some reasons why Jesus is focusing on the seed and bringing it to the forefront. Uh, we learned how this, the hard soil, the stony soil, the thorny soil, and even the soil that is described as being good, in and of itself is dead soil. It cannot generate life. The only living agent in this whole parable is what? The seed, the word of God. It is the only agent that can bring life. Um, we can gain many rich, um, practical, safe theologies, teachings about how to do the Christian life from this. When I was on my journey back into the church, well-meaning people would come up to me and tell me, uh, brother, you got to listen to this DVD. Or brother, you got to read this book. I shared with a brother that when I was in massage therapy in California, many well-intentioned individuals will hand me all kinds of pamphlets and paraphernalia um, to try to engage me in my journey with the Lord. Some of it, some of it was good, but some of it was dangerous. And in this parable, I would like to highlight just one of the many pitfalls that this, the, this, the devil, the enemy, puts in our path as we want to journey back to the Lord. I don't think anyone really, well, I'll just say it. I will share a pamphlet in which it spoke about the, this hot topic within Adventism and maybe, maybe in other Christian groups as well. But it is a, a delicate subject within Adventism regarding perfection. And the emphasis was in overcoming sin. Now, if my emphasis is overcoming sin, and I look at this parable, if all I'm going to be focused on, my energies, my spiritual energies, is on getting rid of stones and getting rid of weeds, in the end, I will have a clean field with no seed. The, the obsession, and some of these individuals, not, not all of them, and they were well-meaning. They didn't want to see me succeed in a spiritual life. But I learned the hard way that some theologies, even within our church, instead of helping, hinder. Because I became so focused in making my ground good, I totally neglected and forgot the fact that there is no life unless it comes from the... And there can be no spiritual life, no genuine spiritual life, unless my focus um, is on that song. Yes, Jesus loves me. That's the seed that generates me in life, spiritual life. So I, I wanted to highlight that because I think it's important for us to understand that, yes, we have victory in Christ. We can have power to overcome in Christ. Christ, but the emphasis can easily, I mean, we have to learn from history, that, uh, that, that saying, that, that um, phrase that we hear, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to do what? And we have in the Bible the history of those that wanted to overcome sin, but actually became more and more embroiled in it. They were called the Pharisees, right? They were consciously trying to please God. But their focus was not on the source of life and power. They were trying to do it on their own. So I am not saying that there is no victory experience in the life of the Christian. But the emphasis of the parable is, if there's going to be any victory, the source is not going to come from the soil, but from where? From the seed, from the living word of God. Amen? So these are central things that Jesus is trying to bring to the forefront of his listeners because if it, the, the, the wise men said there's really nothing new under the sun, and there isn't. The, the theologies that, that the devil has had back then to trip people up and sidetrack people that wanted to please God, they are still with us today. You know, Satan can change the melody, but the lyrics are the same. Does that make sense? So we need as a church to, as a pastor, myself included, make the Word of God the central aspect of our lives. Um, a brother shared with me as I shook hands, um, 
that he was not always a believer. And I guess all, none of us, all of us have that, that beginning point. And I just wanted to one, just briefly touch on this point that I made last week. We should all not get discouraged when we look at that. Um, Jesus is, like the song said, Jesus loves us. And when Jesus presents this to us, it's like a physician giving us a diagnosis, a heart diagnosis. And Jesus is looking around all those hundreds, maybe thousands of people watching him. And he knows that by giving him these four um, categories, he is covering every single one of them. But he is not making mention of this for people to go home discouraged, disheartened, Ah, uh, I'm a hard soil, or, or I'm, I'm, I have tons of thorns in my life. I'm very weedy. What Jesus is trying to do is awaken in his listeners the need for the seed in their lives. He wants to, their, his listeners to say, number one, very few, if not, well, actually, I, I'll say it. I don't think very few of us could boldly say, I'm good soil. I, I mentioned it last week. This parable is speaking about a progressive process. A what? A process. One Christian writer calls it the work of a lifetime. So it doesn't matter really where I'm at. And when I would study with people, I mean, I'm studying with people that are practicing Wicca and kids that are into all sorts of stuff, anything except religion. Yet this parable would engage their imagination, and now they, the seed was in there. And it's not just the, 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 um, the written words on this book that works upon the human heart. The point that I made last week is, long before this book is opened before me, the living Word of God, His Spirit, has already been working in my life. Long before I step into church, God is wanting to make my heart His church, the sole temple where he can abide. And many people have God abiding in them, and they're searching for a literal church where they can come and worship him. This is a wonderfully rich parable. I wanted to just highlight those points. Last week, I was a bundle of nerves because it was my first sermon. Not that I'm not <laughs> that nervous right now, um, but I, 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 I forgot some points, and I wanted to make mention of these. It helped me a lot to learn that though, yes, I can experience victories and God wants me to experience victories in my life, none of those will be experienced genuinely unless my life is centered, built upon, surrounded by the Word of God. Um, Some questions that we asked last week regarding the futility of, of a lifestyle focused on just I have to get rid of this in my life. I have to stop doing this. I have to stop doing that. Um, why, ter- why turn the soil? Why till the soil? Why weed the soil, but yet have a seedless field? The point of the whole sowing is so that the seed can eventually mature and produce what? Fruit. Um, as, uh, my wife and I, were, we were really happy. We came from, as I told you, Berry, Berry and Springs, And if you ever drive through there during this time of the year, you will start catching aromas in the air. The fruit's starting to grow. The spring greeted you with the flowers, uh, the aroma from the flowers. But pretty soon you'll get peaches in the the air and grapes, tons of vineyards. And uh, when they told us you're going to be close to Detroit, we thought, well, we'll trade in peach smell for smog. (laughs) But that wasn't the case. Uh, there's tons of orchards around this area. And yesterday, as I was driving around, I saw something that made me think of this parable. I saw a field with the rows perfectly lined up, no weeds. And you can tell they had worked that, that ground up. And, you know, I thought, that looks beautiful on the outside. But I'm looking at all the other fields, and all the other fields have stuff growing in them. So... My Christian life should not be focused, the aim of my life should not be focused that I look good on the surface because that field will have no harvest come fall. I don't know why the farmer went through all that trouble. Maybe he did something that was going to show something later. But let's pretend for a second that that farmer did all of that work but yet did not plant one single seed in that field. 
What was the point of it all? In the Christian life, Jesus says that many, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord. And he will say, I never, I never was in your life. This, I think, is one of the, one of the, the safeguards of this parable is to guard ourselves, and this is going to be the thrust of this message, on a behavior-centered Christianity. Though, yes, behavior does, Jesus says, by the fruits you will tell them. He said by the fruit. And last, last Sabbath we emphasized that there will be no fruit unless there is first seed. Amen? So the point of the sowing, uh, well, uh, this, this is one of the central points that I wanted to leave in our minds from the first part of the sermon was, I need the word, the seed, to have genuine inner spiritual life. Now we're going to begin with today's message. This was a short, brief review of last week. The point of the sowing. We, we learned that the seed is the word of God. Um, let us spend a little bit the defining fruit. And I, I don't think this is going to be hard, and I don't think this is going to surprise many of you because many other pastors and other books have done a really good job at defining the, the fruits for us. Um, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, we read the following. But the fruit of the what? Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Did you catch the switch? The seed produces the fruit. But the seed is what? The Word of God. In Galatians, what produces fruit? But the fruit of the Spirit. This is what takes the written page and makes it alive in my life. It was the Holy Spirit that anointed Jesus. He disposed himself of the divinity, his, his own divinity. And anything he did, he did it empowered by the Holy Spirit. He became the living word. Peter says that this book came, came because... Men of old, godly men of old, were directed by the Spirit of God. So this book has to be guided, has to be opened, has to be made come alive by the Spirit. Because it will be the Spirit that will take what's in these pages and make it come to life inside of me. Now, this is the evidence of, that, it will, that it has taken root in my heart when these things are, are manifested. Now, I want to make this point that blew my socks away. Like I just said, the main thrust of this message will be this parable is preventing us from narrowing down the Christian life to a life that, life that only focuses on outward behavior. You can't do this. You should be doing that. Do this, do that. Do, 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 do. It's all behavior. The fruits of the Spirit, tell me which one of those is a behavior. If the Holy Spirit is the seed that produces the fruit, the fruit is not behavior. The fruit is the motives behind what I do. One of the points that I'm going to make, and you'll hear it over and over through this sermon, is, and I'm going to ask you this question right now. Can I do something good for the wrong motives? Now, if I do something good with evil intent, is that good good or is it evil? So is God interested in simply us doing good things or regenerating the motives behind what we do? Let me ask you another question. Can a human being, him or herself, muster enough willpower to do outward good? Can a human being change the motives the selfish, pride, proud motives that drive the majority of our behavior. That is the impossibility. And that is the deadness of sin that humanity finds themselves in. Nicodemus would do tons of charitable work, tons of outward good behavior. But Jesus could look into Nicodemus' eyes and say to him, you must be born again because, yes, though outwardly you're doing good things, 
It is fruitless because there is no seed generating spiritual life by which now the motives behind those good things are righteous. Because good deeds done for evil reasons make those deeds evil. And that is the impossibility of every single human being in this planet. We are born with a heart that is exceedingly wicked, deceitful above all things. Who can know it? He finishes with a question. And the question is not, can you figure out my heart? Because it's deceitful. I might deceive you. That's not the point of the passage in Jeremiah 17, 9. The, the point of that the heart is deceitful is, it deceives who? You or me? The heart deceives its owner. The heart will tell you, look at all the good things you're doing. Surely then you must be good. And it is a lie. Are you following? Do you see the, 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 the paramount importance then of the Word of God abiding in my life? The centrality of it all? Because the point is not that I do good. The point is I need a conversion inside so that my motives will be righteous, so that my deeds will be righteous. Because they're not done in me, they're done through the Word through the living Word of God. Does that make sense? This is why I told you, we'll, we'll stick to this. We'll leave it at that. We'll go to the next passage. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. Familiar passages, but I think that in this context, it should bring out fresh new insights as to how to truly do genuine Christianity from the heart. From the heart. Hebrews 4, 12 to 13 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and joint and marrow. Catch the last phrase. And is a discerner of the what? Thought and what is the next word? Now give me a synonym for the word intent. Motives. The word of God discerns not what I do, but why I do it. And it shows it to my heart. One of the greatest personal self-revelations that the Word of God is taking root, is becoming alive in me, is not when I begin to realize I should stop doing something, is when what, the good that I am doing is wrong because my motives are wrong. That takes a miracle. Human Humanity on their own is impossible for us to ever make that discernment on our own unless the Holy Spirit, through the written word, opens to our understanding my motives, the thoughts behind why I do what I do. Is it politics? Is it manipulation? I used to think I was a good friend in high school. The reason I, when the Word of God became alive in me, I began to realize I'm nice to people bigger than me because I don't like bullies. And if I make friends with the big football guys, he's messing with me. You're good. You're good. Here's the answers to the test, by the way. Actually, I found out that I shouldn't make friends with the football guys. I should make friends with the girls that could fight. Because there were girls in my school that the football guys would not mess with. <laughs> and I made friends with them. Oh, your hair looks so pretty today. You wouldn't. I was a liar. I was a liar. I would compliment their outfits when I thought it was, they were not good. I, I did not like their outfits, but I wanted something from them. So I would say nice things, but with crooked, crooked evil motives. I wanted to manipulate and use them for my benefit. And all the while, I am believing that I am a good friend because they're telling me, Ariel, you're such a nice guy. You're always saying nice things. Yep, I know. It's because I'm a good guy. And I even keep Sabbath. I mean, come on. I mean, let us, let us not, I mean, it hit me like a ton of brick when the Holy Spirit finally said to me, yeah, and they were Sabbath keepers that crucified Jesus. They were like, hurry up and die so that we can go and keep Holy Sabbath. The Word of God, without it, 
we are lost. And we can be lost in church. I used to have a hard time when I was a Bible worker and then I got into ministry answering this question. You know, we, we bring to the front people that used to be in gangs, used to be into violence, carousing, drugs, all those things. And their testimony is, I used to do, do these evil things, then Jesus came into my life and I no longer do them. The hard questions that I would get were from the kids that grew up in the church and never did drugs, never joined the gang, never did nothing evil. And then they would ask me, Ariel, how do I know that I'm converted? Ariel, how do I know that I feel like I don't have a testimony? And I would go and say, Lord, what do I say to them? What will change is why you do what you do. Your your outward behavior may be right, but are you here because your parents dragged you to church? Then you're not really here. Would I much rather be somewhere else? I mean, the Word of God is not a stale book that once I close it, it leaves me alone. We saw that it is the seed, but we saw also in Galatians that it is the fruit of the what? The Spirit. And the Spirit is not limited to the the, the binding of this book. The Spirit of God will follow me into the potluck if we were to have one, into the parking lot. The Spirit of God will follow me home. The Spirit of God will be with me when I wake up and when I go down. The Spirit of God will be with me not just when I do things, but when I am thinking about doing things. And it is in there that the Holy Spirit will dialogue with me. Don't think that because you're doing good, you're good. What are your motives? Because to the eyes of God, as he finishes saying, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, There's a twist. There's a change. It is not an impersonal it. It is a him. The word of God is living, so it is a him. It's a person. And there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And the account will not be what did you do, why did you do it. The motives behind our behavior matter to God more than our behavior. Because to him, he knows if the motives are righteous, what will the actions be? But the actions can be good, but if the motives are unrighteous, even the good that I do is filthy rags. Does that make sense? This has always been the case. This is not a New Testament phenomenon. This is not something that only Christians and the New Testament era, which is some of the theologies that float around Christianity. This is not just applicable to us Christians. This has been God's modus operandum from the very beginning. His spirit working in our hearts, not trying to discern our behavior, but the thoughts and intents. Look at, compare Hebrews 4, 12 with Genesis 6, 3, and 5. For the word of God is living and powerful and is a discerner of the thoughts and what else? Intents. Of the heart. Genesis 6, 3 and 5 says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with men forever. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great in the earth, that every what? Intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil. He was not looking at saying they're doing evil things. He was saying their thoughts and motives are evil. So it doesn't matter what they do. It's evil. Jesus says, in the, the, the end days, it will be like in the days of Noah. They were marrying and giving in marriage. Is there something wrong with marrying? Is there something evil in marriage? Only if my motives are wrong. And that's why Jesus qualifies it as every intent and thought of the heart is evil. One can get married for the wrong reasons. He's rich. He's pretty. Or Whatever. God, from the very beginning, his greatest struggle, his his challenge has been to enter into the world of our thoughts and open and generate spiritual life, which will enable me to see that ultimately, in his sight, what matters most is why I do what I do, not what I do. Because once I recognize the impurity behind my motives, he says, now you know you need me. 
now you recognize that it is impossible for you to transform and change the streams of your heart. If my heart produces bitter water, I can go down the stream and sprinkle a ton of sugar, but it will not make the water sweet. But if I can transform and convert the source of that water, then the whole stream is sweet. We're going to continue. So that you don't fall asleep, I'm going to give you a quiz now. Um, what versus why? What I do versus what I do? You tell me, giving the church a generous finan financial offering, is that good or bad? It's good. How about a generous, expensive gift just for Jesus? Is that good or bad? It's good. Now look at these names. Ananias and Sapphira. They gave a generous financial gift to the church. Was their gift good or evil? But you just told me giving financially to the church is good. What made it evil? Their motives, their intent. Mary Magdalene, good or evil? Why? From the heart. Jesus had healed, transformed, converted the source. I'm going to go on another quiz. Behavior versus motive. Um, next one. Kiss Jesus to show that he knew him. You may figure this one out before I show you the name. It says, good or bad? <laughs> Depends who you show. <laughs> uh, how about kiss Jesus because he knew her past yet he loved her? Is that a good kiss or a bad kiss? Kiss Jesus to show that he knew him. Is that good or bad? Is that a bad kiss or a good kiss? Because of the motives. And you know who the one that kissed his feet out of gratitude as, as she poured oil and ointment on him. Last one. The hardest one I'll say for last. Behavior versus motive. This is the hardest one. Confessed his sin versus confessed his sin. Is confessing your sin good or bad? It's good, but what if you're Saul? Why did Saul confess his sin? See how even in things that are so rudimentary that you would think, of course confessing your sin is right, but you can even confess your sins for the wrong motives. And it makes that confession unrighteous. And Satan is constantly trying to confuse us in this. Surely, because you're doing the, a good thing, you must be good. Saul never stopped to ask himself, why do I do what I do? Why am I here? Why do I give tithes and offerings? Why do I attend church? Why did I accept the church position? Why did I accept to be a leader in the church? Why do I not accept positions in the church? Why do I not accept leadership positions in the church? All of those are questions about not what, what we do, but why we do. And that, that is a, those are the areas where, honestly, brethren, experientially speaking, I wrestle with God. I avoid God with, with those things. God loves questions. Genesis chapter 4, he asked Cain, why is your face downcast? God was not saying, I know you're going to murder your brother. You better watch out. God was trying to prevent it by reaching not the actions, the motives, but transforming the motives of Cain. God is not trying to prevent outward behavior. He knows that there's no way the outward behavior will be good, even if doing good things, unless the heart first is transformed. And that can only happen, that can only happen with an encounter, a genuine experiential encounter with the living word of God. Those that have experienced know what that means. Behavior versus motive. This parable is totally against a religion focused entirely just on getting your behavior right while ignoring the motives behind them. Because in the end, motive is what matters most. So, two points that we have learned so far from this parable. I need the word to have genuine inner spiritual life. I need the word to create righteous heart motives to guide my outward behavior. That is fruit.
That is the fruit of the Spirit. Not just doing something, uh, feeding the hungry. One of the fruits of the Spirit is faithfulness, kindness, gentleness. We can speak the truth, but speak it like a dog that needs to be vaccinated against rabies. Or I can speak the truth in love, as Paul tells us to do. And love is the first fruit of the Spirit, one of the first manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit. Speaking the truth in kindness, gentleness. Speaking the truth is not enough. Giving Bible studies is not enough. Preaching the Word is not enough. It has to be backed up by righteous motives. And righteous motives can only come from the fruit of the Word guided by the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we are just, we are church only on the surface. If you dig below it, you will find a void of the Word of God, a void of the seed. This is a psalm that, as I read through the Bible, that was one of the first goals that I placed myself. And in California, um, the Lord afforded me time after studies at night, I would sit there with the Bible. trying. To, I wanted to read the whole thing. I realized I've been an, a Christian for so many years, and I barely read passages, let alone entire books. So I made it a point I want to read through the entire Bible, and that is an awesome experience. I highly recommend it if you have not done that. It, it will teach you discipline. You may not learn much of the detail in the Bible, but it will teach you discipline to stick to it. To, uh, stick to it. But when I found this passage, I underlined it. Psalms 139, verses 23 through 24 is a prayer of a human being that recognizes I need to have a change not of my behavior, but my motives that drives my behavior. Psalms 139, 23 to 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my heart thoughts, and see if there be any, any wicked way outside of me? So what, what is David asking? What kind of wicked way would be in him? His motives. His motives. Call Uriah from the battle, battlefield. Uriah, I'm going to be nice to you. Why don't you spend some time with your wife, buddy? You're, you're, you're oops, you're right there. His motives were sordid. His motives were dark, evil, without restraint. On the outward, he may have told himself, I'm good. But David realized, Lord, I can't even trust my own self to search my own heart. I need the living word of God that can discern the intents and thoughts of my heart to show me if there's any wicked way in me. But don't just leave me there, Lord. Lead me in the way everlasting. How do you feel about this promise? How do you feel about this passage, about this prayer? I feel the need of God's word actively working in my life right now, today. Church, We will grow as a congregation. But if at the end of however many years the Lord wants me to serve here, I feel that I have not done my, I feel that I have done my job if however long I am here, I can only increase your love for the Word of God or initiate it. But however long I am here, the, the majority of my sermons will be invitations to be engaged in a real, intentional, living, consistent way with God's Word. It is our most essential need, the only source for spiritual life. Lord Jesus, for many years I would memorize the TV guide on Sunday for the whole week. That's not, you know that I'm telling the truth, Lord. I, I, I would learn comic books, and I would memorize codes and tricks for video games. And that's what I engaged most of my life with, Lord. Totally void. 
totally empty, thinking I was good because I went to church on the right day. But you had mercy and compassion, Lord. And I know that you, you don't feel that way just towards me, but to all of us. We can all attest to your long-suffering and compassionate, patient towards us. So as a church, Lord, this morning, we want to pray like David. Search us. Try us. Reveal to us, Lord, why we do the things we do. We want to feel a genuine need, a genuine hunger for your word, for your presence, for a knowledge of who you are. We want a transformation of our lives, Lord, beyond just the behavior, but why we do the things we do. Lord Jesus, work in our hearts. David also prayed, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. We pray that this morning too, Lord. Change, transform why we do the things we do. In Jesus' name, amen.